I knew I was going to forget to do that once. Um, so I am recording this session about how to engage students and teachers during COVID-19. Um, the recording will be shared on our Facebook page, which is a private group. And then I'll also send a follow-up email to everybody who registered for this program or any of our other programs with all the links that are mentioned today, all the resources that our presenters mentioned, and the recording of this session so you can share it with colleagues, um, pass it along to people. Um, okay, so again, my name is Allison Campbell. Um, thank you all for joining us today for our Common Concerns program. And I'd like to first introduce Molly Woolmouth. While Molly is the lead program manager at the Washington State Historical Society, and I'd like to, to toss it over to her to get us started. Thank you, Allison. And hello, everyone. I'm just going to hit start on my timer like a good presenter, so I don't talk too long. Because honestly, I'm really excited to hear from Holly specifically because she's already done so much of the good work, so I'm really excited to hear about how their virtual program has been going. But as Allison said, I'm lead program manager at the Washington State Historical Society. Um, that means I'm kind of responsible for public programming, educational programming, and then our local outreach programming. And our team consists of two full-time staff and two part-time staff. So we've all been working remotely through this process, trying to figure out how we're going to do the big job of staying connected to all of our audiences, even though we're doing so remotely. And all of us like in different cities and things like that simultaneously. So we've been having a great time figuring that out. But um, I wanted to start off by just saying, we as a team at the Washington State Historical Society have viewed this as a, a time of opportunity. Um, it's kind of a step back from the status quo and just doing things as we've always done them. So we're hoping to stay positive through this whole process and figuring out ways to connect with our audiences. But we're definitely struggling with how to also remain realistic about our resources in terms of our time and our staffing and all those things, which I'm sure you all understand, but finding that balance, just like we always have to do between burning ourselves out, but staying excited about all of these great opportunities we have. So that's something that we're definitely trying to keep in mind as we're figuring out our process and our approach to educational programming during this time. So um, I figured I would just go through some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves at the Washington State Historical Society as kind of a guide for some of the things that maybe you all could be thinking about in terms of your approach to educational programming and virtual programming. Um, so first question is, what's within your mission? Um, sometimes it's really easy to get excited and like, you know, curve way off your mission, but it's good to kind of like refocus and keep that in mind. So for us, it's great because we get to partner with our community to explore how history connects us all. And then in our vision, we want to be the state's primary history educator. So um, that sounds like we have a big, a big job in figuring out how we can stay connected with all of our audiences during this time. But it's great because I think it refocuses everyone's attention on educational programming as something that's really significant. And I think it's a big opportunity for historical societies to kind of double down and say like, hey, we are really important in sharing our state's history, our city's history, our local history, and connecting with educational audiences. So I think that's a really big opportunity for all of us. Another question is, who is your current audience? And what is your current relationship with schools? So at the Washington State History Museum, we serve about 14,000 students annually through field trips and then our History Box program. Um, and usually that's focused on fourth and seventh graders. So that's when you cover Washington state history specifically. Um, and with all, all of this work on grants recently, um, we've actually done some data analysis that we haven't taken the time to do previously. So now I know, thanks to our team, um, that in the last five years, we've actually served schools in 79 different counties. So we're serving students already from a broad geographical area, even in person. Um, and we've been able to serve more schools locally, especially in uh, Tacoma Public Schools because of our scholarship program over the last couple of years. So we have a little bit of a different mission too that we're supposed to serve the entire state. And we try to do that through our online curriculum. So I'll kind of revisit that. Um, but what we've kind of been seeing different museums doing that are 
local is kind of building on the relationships that you already have. So for us, we're, we don't have as strong partnerships directly with school districts like some of you might have. Um, so I know that the presenters, other presenters that weren't able to make it today at LeMay America's Car Museum just specifically reached out to their personal contacts and said like, hey, is there a way that we can help? Like, we don't want you to feel overwhelmed because we know that you're trying to transition, but they definitely were met with excitement from the Tacoma Public Schools and saying like, yeah, we really are interested in what you're working on. So definitely continue to build on the relationships that already exist and see if there's ways that you can support the audience that you currently have. Let's see. And then another question is, what does your museum do well and what resources do you already have that you can share? Um, we rely super heavily on just like regular school visits. Like for a lot of school districts, we're kind of like the, the go-to place for the Washington State History checkbox. So we need to figure out ways that we can still kind of be the place where that happens, but we might need to be doing that virtually. So that's something that we're thinking about right now. Um, another thing that we do really well is we have a faci facilitated field trip option called History Lab, and it's a hands-on opportunity, which no hands-on anything anymore, which is something that we need to look at, but um, it offers an inquiry-based learning experience that's based in object analysis. So it gives students an opportunity to engage directly with objects and kind of learn from them in a way that a historian would. So we're thinking about like, is there a way that we can translate that really popular field trip experience into something that's virtual? We're still playing around with that. But I will show you, before I move on to that, just a second, let me finish what I'm talking about here. Um, <laughs> something that we also have in our arsenal, I guess, is we have an updated website now with a, a really large online collection. So that's something that makes it really easy for us to be able to utilize. Um, we're looking at how do we take that facilitated experience and utilize that online collection as an opportunity for like a mind on learning as opposed to hands on learning. So those are some of the resources that we're specifically looking at. But for all of you, I would really think about what resources do you have that would be easy for school groups to kind of use even virtually. So that might be really great objects. That might be really great images. You might have people that you work with that have these amazing skills and abilities that you can utilize in a virtual setting that maybe you can't do as well in person. So you're seeing like the Burke Museum, they're engaging with artists who are using opportunities of drawing to be able to educate. So there's all sorts of new opportunities that you can use with the resources that you currently have. But um, another question is, how can you remain flexible during this time of uncertainty? So like how, it's like that scale and balance, right? Like there are these moments where you wanna like be quick and have an immediate response so that you're serving all of those audiences. But then there's also like the long range goals. You don't wanna be creating materials that aren't going to get utilized and don't serve your audience well or create things that will be totally unusable even when people are like back in your museum. So we've taken a few different responses to that and obviously we're a larger organization so we were able to do a few things that you might not be able to do but smaller organizations have a much better opportunity to be nimble so it's easier to kind of like shift and adapt for all of you whereas we're kind of like turning this big ship of like how are we going to approach this but let me show you some of like the quick things that we did to approach that Okay, can you all see this? Yes, thumbs up from Allison. Okay, so um, on this website, we just took some of our older curriculum and updated it in a way that it could be usable right now. So there are like flashier things that we've been able to do recently, but you don't need to do things like an app to be able to engage directly with some of your curriculum, although we have that but you don't need to have that to do this. But let me show you an example. 
we have these little activity sheets right here that are based on some of our exhibits that we currently have up. Permanent exhibits, temporary exhibits. But it's just like little activities that we were able to create from things that we already had and then able to get those up and share them. So those got shared with um, some of our teachers list that we already have with the audiences that we already have using resources we already had and just were able to adapt them enough so that schools had something that they were able to share. And I am almost out of time. So let me point you at one more thing. So this was our immediate response. What we're looking at in the future is something a little bit different, knowing that schools are going to be having a few different approaches to what the academic year is going to look like. So let's see. Here is the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction put out guidance for the coming academic year. It's a relatively large PDF document that's accessible on their website, but I was surprised to hear that the superintendent came out last week and just said like, we're going to be doing in-person school next year. And it was like, what does that mean and what does that look like? And this document kind of walks you through a little bit more of their thinking process about what that might entail. And for the most part, that doesn't just mean like we're opening up school and we're all going back in person, but it does mean that they're hoping to have like direct teacher to student interaction. So they're looking at all of these different models, which are outlined in this document that are things like um, kind of phased re-entry. So smaller groups of students coming in on different days um, while other kids are at home doing virtual learning. But all of this is to say like the school year isn't going to look the same next year as it did at the start of last year. So virtual educational programming is going to be a part of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to be thinking about, like, are there opportunities for that phased in approach as well. I kind of keep thinking about, um, like, those organizations like the Fife History Museum has this amazing, like, locomotive and caboose in front of their museum. And it's like, that's a great place to be socially distant. Like, you could have groups actually come out and be spaced out and be able to access that and then have some other, like, virtual follow up to that. But I'm happy to answer more questions about this moving on, but I am ready to hear from Holly, who has actually done all of the amazing work on testing out some virtual field trip programming. So thank you. See you all on the other side. Can't wait to hear from you, Holly. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, as you can see, um, Molly and her team, her super capable team, are um, really still kind of in the thinking through phase of this. And, and as she mentioned, that's part of being in a larger organization. So Holly Stewart comes to us as the program manager at the Joe Carr Cabin Museum. And um, she and her colleague Christopher are the only two staff members and they rely on a huge volunteer core in normal times. And so I think she can really kind of speak to, um, you know, the museums that are not as well resourced perhaps as the State Historical Society and how she's kind of approaching um, the, the challenges presented by um, COVID-19 and, and keeping up with um, with her school programs. So I would love to introduce Holly um, from Joe Carr Cabin Museum. Thank you, Allison. So like she said, my name is Holly Stewart and I work at the Joe Carr Cabin Museum. We're in Tacoma um, and we are a small organization. We have two part-time staff uh, and an annual budget under $100,000. Uh, and this year we're celebrating 20 years as a museum. And yay, um, education is central to our organization's mission. And we have had a focus on interactive learning for elementary students in our community. And our education programs have always been offered fee free as our board has felt strongly that costs should not be a barrier to access. So last year, in 2019, we reached over 51 schools with our traveling trunk curriculum. Uh, throughout the South Sound region and these interdisciplinary traveling trunks are designed for third and fourth grade classrooms. That's our target audience and over 1700 students, teachers and chaperones visited the cabinet for a field trip. So when 2020 began, we looked to be on track to beat those numbers, but then the pandemic hit and we had to look at revamping 
our entire school's outreach program. Um, spring is usually our big field trip season, and we hosted four field trip groups in February before schools shut down in March. Uh, and so there's over 30 schools that didn't get a chance to come and see us in person. Uh, and we've always prided ourselves on being an interactive space, but that just isn't feasible with this new reality. So we are really shifting gears here. So we started um, in March and April by adding a new Learn at Home section to our website. I'm gonna pull that up here. And you can see some of the things on here, we have an art contest, we have some activities you can do at home, uh, coloring pages and activity pages. Uh, and many of those were things that we had already developed in house, but we had not published on our website. Um, we shared these with our educated contacts and received really positive feedback from teachers. And in April, we had nearly 400 unique page views on that portion of our website. Um, our usual web traffic is about 400 people, so it doubled our web <laughs> presence. Uh, next, we transformed three of our lesson plans from our in-class traveling trunk curriculum to individual home-based learning. And these are much more in-depth learning for third and fourth grade students. They align with the common core standards. We develop them with teacher input um, and coordination with the local school district. Uh, so we posted uh, those on the website and we also posted a variation of our walking tour that we usually do during field trips as a downloadable PDF that families could use to do a social distance history walk through the neighborhood. And when we posted those on the website, we also shared those links with our educator contacts and, and immediately heard back from teachers that they plan to use those materials with their students. Um, we also reached out to the libraries and Pierce County libraries added a link to our materials from their website. Uh, we sent out additional flyer to Tacoma Public Schools families about these free resources. And in May, we had over 200 unique um, visitors to the webpage, and most of them were downloading the lesson plans and walking tour materials. So we know that they're being accessed and being used. Uh, let me share a sample of one of those lesson plans here. Two. So we just made this a really basic um, Word document that we transformed into a PDF. Um, gives an introduction to what the lesson plan is, vocabulary, what kind of materials this includes. Um, there's extension activities included with it. And then how to use this material either as a guided um, lesson with the teacher or on their own while they're learning at home. And web links and things like that. So uh, then field trips. So as I mentioned, field trips are a big part of our education programming. Um, we actually had three schools that we have had long-term relationships approach us about testing out virtual field trips. And we said, why not? Let's get this a try before school's out. Um, two of those teaching teams were able to follow through with scheduling, um, but each with slightly different formats. And we wanted to make sure that the field trips were engaging and tailored to each group of students, not just a generic video. Um, kids, elementary students particularly, have not the greatest attention spans, and so we wanted to make sure this wasn't going to be a boring video that they were just watching. Um, so in both cases, the teachers sent out materials from our Learn at Home webpage to the students in advance, and then they collected questions from the students that we could answer during the field trip video. And so the first school that we worked with collected over 70 questions from their students which is a lot. Uh, <laughs> they sent me the questions a few days in advance so we could group them into categories. 
and put together sort of a script for the field trip. Um, then I had a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with one of the teachers where I was broadcasting from the museum and he was broadcasting from his home. Um, it was sort of interview style with the teacher asking questions on behalf of the students and we called out their names individually as we answered the questions. Uh, our local school district has been particularly concerned with student privacy, so we are not able to hold a live video chat with students as we could see into students' homes, and they don't want to have that happen. Uh, but the teacher recorded the Zoom call with me, and that lasted about 30 minutes, and then sent out a link to the students. The second school that we worked with last week uh, took a different approach. They also collected student questions to guide the field trip, uh, then a teacher came to the cabin in person with a tablet to record her visit. Um, she wore a mask while recording the video that she later edited into four short segments. And each segment highlights a different portion of the museum, answers student questions related to that theme, and provides instructions for a craft activity that they could do at home. Um, while the teacher was at the cabin, she picked up supplies and we recorded the video. And then their teaching team actually delivered a craft kit to each student's home to accompany the field trip experience. Uh, and the teaching team also recorded themselves taking that walking tour through the neighborhood so students could see a video of the landmarks in the neighborhood around the museum. So what we're planning uh, for next year, um, the new guidelines for schools seem to um, spell out that students will not be leaving school grounds for field trips next year and that visitors to schools are discouraged. So we plan to continue enhancing our virtual learning opportunities for next school year. Um, this summer, we'll keep expanding on the lesson plan content that's available for teachers, transforming that classroom curriculum into something that works for guided at home and individual learning. Uh, since even if students are face-to-face -face in a classroom, they will not be working in groups or sharing materials. And so having our traveling trunks in the classroom just really is not feasible. Uh, we also plan to record some general field trip video segments with one of our living history volunteers that we can share with educators and with the general public. And we plan to offer virtual field trip opportunities to all Tacoma Elementary Schools and neighboring districts in that customizable format. And I sent a link to Allison so she can share also uh, one of the clips from one of the videos so you can kind of see how that worked uh, with the teacher and I at the museum. Allison, I think you're muted. Yes, I am. I just did it. Was I just talking and still <laughs> muted? Isn't that amazing? How many months into this are we? And I still can't. Anyway, I, all I was doing was lavishing praise on Holly. Um, I really do feel like you've been a trailblazer here um, and, and bravely jumping in. And I think we can all learn so much from, um, from your hard work so far. I think my big takeaways from, from your experience are just the idea of just being really flexible um, with uh, within your capacity of course i mean i think teachers are going to have such different needs um and <clears throat> i know because i see holly on the the facebook parenting groups um you know just in the the almost four months now that we've been schooling from home it went from in the very beginning all of all of our organizations and museums scrambling to support parents right who were kind of panicking about how to keep their kids active at home <laughs> and then as soon as the schools kind of caught up and and were ready to kind of start um more proactively engaging students it the pendulum swung to really working hard to support teachers and getting them sort of what they need um, to support kids at home and um and so i just think that yeah, it's uh, flexibility is the, the name of the game. And, and I think um, our, our museums and, and our education teams um, almost have to be anticipating, you know, what that next need is going to be. And in the fall, I mean, I think that it's still a, a, a it's still a kind of who knows, but um, kind of a best guess situation. Um, I love, Holly, that you connected with, with the 
local libraries. Um, hopefully some of our organizations out there already have those relationships just to share and get the word out, right? Because it's one thing to do all of this hard work to put together something that, um, that teachers can really use, but then you got to let folks know that it's there. Um, and so like Molly was also saying, you know, use the connections that you already have. And as I, I referenced this Facebook group that Holly and I are a part of, I think it's called 253 Parents Get Resourceful. Is that it? I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I see that Holly has been sharing the, the art challenges that Job Card does and, and a lot of these materials. And there are thousands of parents on that. And teachers um, are really looking at those Facebook groups. And I would be willing to bet that every single area code has one of these um, parenting groups that just kind of popped up in those early days um, and, and really is a great way to, to get right to the to the, to the folks that you want to kind of be using this stuff. So um, super, super exciting. Um, so Linda had a question um, about um, sort of recording these virtual programs. Um, and Holly, did you just use your iPhone or what kind of, what kind of equipment were you using? So for the first field trip, um, I was using um, my laptop to record the Zoom and then I had um, our museum, we did purchase a gimbal, which is like a tripod set up for a phone. Um, and I just have an Android phone that I hooked up to that so that I could take some zoom in shots of objects and artifacts I wanted to share during that field trip. The second visit that we did with the teacher in person, she brought her iPad um, tablet and just um, held it up to, to record the video. Yeah, so pretty lo-fi, and I would say that if you're going to invest in one very inexpensive piece of equipment to kind of up your your phone recording game, some kind of tripod is key. You know, if uh, just to keep those shots sort of steady is is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So I would um, thank you so much, Holly. Um, I would love to open this up for any other questions people have or any other ideas. Um, if you have sort of some thoughts or a program that you'd like to share with the group, maybe just um, mention in the, the comments, hey, I'd like to share something we're doing and we'll unmute you and bring you into the conversation. Um, <clears throat> I, while we're kind of, while people are thinking of questions or maybe we answered them all, um, <laughs> I, uh, I do, um, had to, and I just had a question that has escaped me. <laughs> um, I do, oh, I do know what I wanted to mention. I did want to just mention that we were hoping to be joined by um, two colleagues from the education team at the LeMay Le American Car Museum, but I do want to acknowledge that they're not here because they've been furloughed um, again, uh, which I think really speaks to um, the kind of economic pressures that all of our museums are facing. And I know for many of you, school programs, um, not so much for Job Carr, their, their business model is a little different, but for a lot of us, school programs is, is a source of revenue um, and sort of thinking about how to monetize that is really challenging right now. And I don't know, Molly, have you, with your colleagues that you've been speaking to, um, is there any conversation about whether you would be charging for any any programs in the fall? Yeah, um, for a number of museums in Tacoma, I know that a lot of the models that they were looking at, they would be hoping to charge for different types of virtual field trip opportunities, but with like um, big options for scholarships. So it looks like they're still hoping to be able to offer that. Um, I know for us, we offer a sliding scale based on percentage of free and reduced lunch. So I think that if, if we were planning on doing a facilitated virtual field trip, I think we would be looking at something very similar. So um, for our in-person field trips, I mean, a self-directed field trip is anywhere between two to five dollars per student with teachers and chaperones for free. Um, and then the facilitated versions are anywhere between four and seven dollars per student. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out what that might look like. But um, as all of you know, there's definitely something to be said for making sure that people see the value in what it is that you're presenting, even if it's like a minimal amount. Yeah, and I, and I do think that um, it's important to be aware that individuals and schools are experiencing their own kind of economic pressures right now. And I think that there are, are going to increasingly be really good models for 
of how to use the right kind of language, that idea of a sliding scale, uh, pay what you can kind of stuff. I think we'll start to see more and more of that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Peggy was wondering, and, and I think I think we might need to work on putting together a sort of how to program on how to do how to do the technical side of some of these virtual programs because Peggy was wondering Holly did you use some kind of um, editing software or like an app to put together your your videos or do you know if the teacher did so the first video the zoom call with the teacher um, was just like this a recording one-on-one uh, -on -one with the teacher and there was no editing it was a one-shot take and that's it uh, <laughs> and yeah. we were both doing it for the first time so we did like a five minute test of the first part of the video and then stopped and checked in with each other and like okay is the lighting look okay does the sound look okay um, and then we just did a one shot take for the rest of it um, the second video the um, teacher who recorded it she did the editing and she said she was just using iMovie to do her editing yeah i will say i i find for those of you who are Apple users, iMovie is pretty intuitive, um, but uh, I also know that there is a lot of free editing software out there and available. So um, if anybody knows somebody who kind of has done this really successfully and know there's, knows their way around um, putting together a good, good, the technical side of a good virtual program, I think the folks in Wenatchee have been doing some good stuff and she was talking about, um, uh, maybe I'll invite them to come and do kind of a how-to for us because um, I think there are lots of questions. Um, so, oh yes, uh, Michael at the Tacoma Historical Society shared a link to some of the audiobooks that they've been recording, which I love, that's awesome. Um, Christy uh, mentioned that uh, they're kind of thinking about when um, in-person classes and that kind of thing can happen and if anybody has kind of thoughts on restarting those, um, as we move through the phases, is, is any planning already happening for those sorts of in-person experiences? Yeah, Molly, what are you? I mean, for, for us, we keep talking about like, there are just so many unknowns. It's hard to move forward when you don't know anything. Um, so for us, we've made the decision that we're not going to do in-person programming for the rest of the calendar year. This allows us to continue with like planning virtual programming and becoming really good at producing virtual experiences for all of our audiences. Um, so kind of like what our broader audience engagement team at the Washington State Historical Society, it's like bringing more of the things into the known, even though, you know, we're not really sure, but kind of being comfortable with making that decision since we're a larger ship. But um, it might be worthwhile to just be like, well, like, we know that we want to do virtual programming for this amount of time, and then we'll reassess on this date. That's kind of how we approached our field trips when everything kind of started happening was we were just said to schools like, hey, we're canceling field trips for now. We're going to reassess. We'll communicate. So I think just being open about what you're planning on doing to your audiences. Yeah, and I do know, and I know this is on everybody's mind. Um, so just to update you on the statewide museum reopening plan, <laughs> it's been presented to the governor's office last week. We are waiting, hopefully, for a thumbs up about that. Um, but there is definitely room within that plan, I, I think, to get, depending on your physical space and what kind of, um, what, kind of public health kind of protocols you can meet to perhaps do a small family workshop, you know, sometime in the not too distant future, everybody in a mask or however, however, you know, it fits into that plan. So, um, you know, I do think that uh, that's the thing. Museums come in all shapes and sizes. And <laughs> so um, there, there's going to be some really creative ways to navigate a lot of this stuff, I think, but I think it's going to look pretty different everywhere. Have so you we, talked about Colleen Dillon Schneider at all? I've shared a lot of, of her mm -hmm. content on the um, Facebook group. Yeah, so Colleen um, Dillon Schneider does a lot of research data on intent to return to cultural organizations and sort of gauging how comfortable audiences will feel in coming back to places like museums. And the good news, at least the last set of data I looked at, is they, they feel pretty comfortable coming back to museums. Not as comfortable going back to like 
a live theater performance or a movie where they're in a contained space, space for a prolonged period of time. But because museums provide a certain amount of freedom of movement, people I think feel, or the data indicates they feel safer. That's really promising um, for all of us, yeah. For us, I feel like we've kind of created a few different touch points that we use as a reference. So it's like, you can look at like, data in the industry as a touch point, you can look at like your county guidelines and just be checking in and seeing what that looks like. And then looking at like all of the state information about what it looks like for our industry and what the recommendations are. So I think like if you're triangulating based on like all these different sets of data and kind of looking at those, then it will be helpful in making those decisions depending on where you're at. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so also so I wanted to mention for our family programs, um, so we have typically had a once a month craft Saturday program at the museum. And obviously that's been canceled. We've turned it into virtual things that they can download from home for now. But we're thinking that once we reach phase three and the museum can reopen, that we might provide some virtual, um, not virtual, we have some take and go craft kits that people could pick up from outside the museum on the porch or if it's a nice day out in the park uh, that we're located in um, and get all the supplies that they need, instructions and materials, and then they could take those home to do the activities. So um, not sure when that would start yet, but depending on county guidelines. Yeah, and I suspect, so if you haven't been to the Job Car Cabin Museum, it's situated on the edge of a public park. Um, those of you who have outdoor space, I'm sure are already thinking of creative ways to use it. It will provide for you, I think, a lot more flexibility um, as we move through the phases. Um, I know personally, I feel a lot more comfortable and all of the scientific data suggests that we are safer outside than inside. Um, so yeah, so a couple of more things from the chat. First of all, Lacey, I'm gonna be contacting you to hear more about your YouTube channel and your editing skills. <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. Um, so I know um, there was a, a question here about Google Classrooms. I know my kids are using Microsoft Teams. I know some schools are using Zoom. There are all these different platforms that the schools internally are using um, to work with students. Um, I don't know, I don't know, Holly, have you popped into a, on behalf of the museum, popped into a, a, a classroom session that way using any of those platforms? No, I've been in my son's classroom yeah. sessions <laughs> on Teams. Um, they are not working well for second and third graders, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> getting around in a chair, that's all I see. Yeah. <laughs> heads down on the table. Yeah, it's, it's um, chaotic to say the least. Um, but like I said, uh, at least our understanding is that our local school district does not want outside people to be in those teams meetings um, because you have a view into students homes and that's an invasion of privacy so yeah i would definitely um i can imagine in a school district um not quite so big as tacoma public schools or with different concerns there is an opportunity there to um to face to face with a class via one of these platforms that the classes are using. I think that there's probably some, some thinking and planning that needs to happen um, around some of those issues of privacy, but it could be an opportunity. Um, yeah, yeah, it's something that I, I... Each school district is totally different. So like, I know that virtual field trips have been happening on the platforms in Olympia, Tumwater North Thurston school districts. So I think it, it just depends on like who you're working with. Yeah, check with your educator contacts. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Yep, so Eric's there in the, in the chat and he um, can share some information with folks um, who are interested in hiring a consultant to do some of this video work for sure. Um, and there's lots of folks out there who can do that kind of work. Peggy was wondering about the idea of including a museum pass. You know, museums are gonna start reopening here um, pretty soon um, as a way for families to come and visit, um, uh, maybe for, for free for a period of time um, and communicating that through the schools, I guess. I don't know, Molly, we, we do a lot of that. What, what have, are we talking about anything like that? We are. <laughs> 
everything's on the table. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's something that we've done um, just in the past with all of our field trips is like offering like, oh, like bring your family back. Here's a discount card. So I think now is definitely the time to encourage that. And I'm sure parents have got to be looking for all sorts of things to do with their kids. And if they trust your organization, which the data suggests that like the public trusts museums to do, you know, to take care of all of these things. But yeah, I would definitely encourage things like that. Encourage families to come back. And especially because then the kids get to be the experts. Just good, good practice for all of us to do, right? And I do, again, as we were saying before, kind of anticipating what families and educators will need. Tacoma Public Schools are out this Friday's the last day of school. That pendulum is going to swing hard back in the other direction, where now we have a bunch of parents with kids at home because there's no in-person summer camps. And, and I'm still, you know, working full time every day. So what, you know, I think that all those materials that you maybe were, were putting together at the beginning of the, the quarantine will be ready to kind of refresh and reintroduce to people. Not even that you need to do new materials, but just remind people, um, remind parents that, um, that this stuff is out there. And then if you can, um, you know, encourage families to revisit some of this content um, and then hopefully invite them back to the museum midsummer. That's kind of a great, great one, two punch for sure. Um, well, this has been awesome. I uh, am really grateful to, of course, Molly and Holly for sharing their thinking about this topic and Holly for sharing her actual experience doing some of this stuff with us. Right. It's nice to know it can be done. And, <laughs> um, and again, uh, you know, everybody in the chat has been so generous with their kind of ideas. Um, so the chat I save, um, and so some of those links, like I'll certainly save a couple of these links here um, in the in the follow up um, email that I'll send out. Um, but I would just ask um, you all to be thinking about again, if you're looking down the barrel of kind of re envisioning your school programs, and there's some piece of this puzzle, like the like the video editing piece. Um, that that seems really challenging. Let me know and I will try and, and find some resources um, to sort of help you. Um, as Eric mentioned, there are some grants out there, um, but we can also put together um, just sort of a kind of how-to um, to get folks started with this stuff. And of course, there is a huge spectrum. I just know within my own experience, you know, you can do the video on your phone and do the quick edit and, and learn as you go. And then you can just get deeper and deeper into it and get more professional looking. And, um, and I will just reiterate, um, because I'm finding that it is still really holding true, um, our audiences are being very gracious with us in this time, right? Um, you know, when we're filming things from our backyard and we forget to unmute ourselves and, um, you know, people, we're all kind of feeling our way through this as an entire society. And I think that allows us to maybe um, take some risks um, that we wouldn't have taken otherwise because we do have this, it feels like we have this kind of grace period um, and people are just grateful for, our work and for engaging them. And, um, and that feels, that feels good. I'm a silver lining kind of person. So, um, I appreciate um, that and I appreciate all of your graciousness. Um, thank you so much. I will follow up with an email either later today or first thing tomorrow. Um, again, I will actually, I'll follow, uh, oh, and, uh, email me if you'd like the link to register for that ACTCHO, um, meeting at noon. Um, or you can certainly head over to their website. And um, I think that's everything. Yes. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Holly. Everyone have a good rest of your day. And we appreciate you so much. Take care. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, of course.